Welcome to Conversations on the Coast, the Bay Area's premier author interview program. And uh, today we are honored uh, by the very presence of our guest. He is a Vietnam veteran and Medal of Honor recipient. His name is Sammy Lee Davis. And with Carolyn Lambert, he's written a book called You Don't Lose Till You Quit Trying. Lessons on Adversity from a Vietnam Veteran and Medal of Honor Recipient. It's published by Berkeley Caliber Books, and that is an imprint of Penguin Random House. Welcome aboard. Thank you, sir. Good to be with you. The, uh, the bio that they provide on, on the book says, tells us that uh, you're from America's heartland. But I would I would say they need they they need to go ahead. I grew up in French Camp, California. Yeah, that that's that's, you've you've been all around that heartland, and and extended it to California. And the reason for that was the employment situation of your dad, right? That's fact, yes, sir. Dad, ever six months, the job that he was at. We, he finished, and then they moved to the next refinery, and then they would put in the cracking unit, and that took six months from the time they walked in till they flipped the switch and walk out, and then we would move someplace else, and that's what we did all over. Wherever there's a refinery, we were there. By 1967, uh, you're a private first class in an artillery unit, which was hit by a massive enemy offensive, and we're talking the Vietnam War. You're yes, 21 years old, resolved to face the onslaught, and prepared to die. Soon, you would have a perforated kidney, crushed ribs, a broken vertebra, ripped flesh from be- beehive darts, a bullet in your thigh, and burns all over your body. And the yes, fight was only beginning. That's it's, a fact, yes, sir. It's an amazing story. An amazing. So you quit trying. <laughs> The, the the whole point of that, though, why why would you hang in after suffering all those hurts and injuries? When I seen Gwendell Holloway, which Gwendell lives in Stockton, California, when I seen Gwendell stand up and wave his boonie hat at me from across the river, I knew I had to go get him because I knew in my heart that he would come get me. So I, just, I simply did for my brothers what I knew they'd do for me. And that was a lesson that you learned from your mother, who said yes, you could sir. never you could never leave a brother behind. That's a fact, yes, sir. I think that being from the heartland, even as you've extended it, it, it was uh, it was a, a lively background. You came from a family with a history of citizen soldiers, did you not? That's a fact. Every male in my family has been in the military, going way back too. Yes, sir, to the Spanish-American War, and even farther, actually, but I didn't know them. Yes, one of the things that struck me in reading the book is the, the kind of natural way that you you know, gravitated to the military and, and just went, and uh, as though there was no other course. It was my turn. And That's you, what my dad told me. He said, well, okay, when I told him that I joined the army he said well okay son go do your job because mm-hmm. that's what he did and his dad before him did his job and that's how we retain our freedom in america and the war that was on the challenge was the vietnam war perhaps our yes, least sir. our least popular till this one and well the reason why i went to vietnam was to help a people be free mm-hmm and we kept them free for 11 years, and then our government gave it back to the communists. That's true. That's true. Yes, sir. Now, there was, there's a lot of, you know, reports in, in, in your book about the combat situation and what went on. But there's also some, some other stuff that uh, I'd like to bring up. One is the story of the pink elephants. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about the pink elephants. It's one of my favorite parts of the book. Well, the, the three pink elephants. Uh, 
the elephants, and we had elephants all over in South Vietnam. All the elephants down where we were, when they would wallow in the mud, they were just muddy. But the elephants up north, where the clay was, where the, the soil was a clay, a red clay, yeah, they would look pink. That's how red the soil was up north. So if you've seen an elephant come walking down the Ho Chi Minh Trail that was pink, you knew that it had came from up north. And that's when we seen the three out pink elephants, we knew that they had had to, they had to have come from up north. And, so, and, and therefore were, were fair game to be Well, sure. they were trucks, and that's because when, when we called it in, they said, well, you have to take them out. And we said, well, we can't shoot elephants. And they said, well, you have to because that's the VC trucks. <laughs> they were hauling, and sure enough, when we got down a little bit closer to them, we could see that they were just piled high with guns and ammunition. And by the time we did a circle back around getting – Tell you know for the our air fact controller to tell us what to do. They had already unloaded the three elephants and were hiding. All the three elephants were standing there, and we said, "Well, you know, we we don't have to shoot them." And I said, "No, no, you have to because they're going to reload them and bring them down." Yeah, sure. The trail. Yeah. So we had to go ahead and I uh, shot three elephants. That's the three. Uh, that's one of my greatest sadness of Vietnam was that I shot three elephants. That it, it still breaks my heart, and that's been almost 50 years ago. And I think the reason why it broke your heart is the way you were raised. Well, yes, sir. I mean, what you shoot is your food. Is that right? That was the only reason Dad said that you killed an animal was to feed your family. Now, we did go back, and when we landed, we got a vehicle and drove out to where the elephants were, and we told the villages around there that we were going to be bringing them elephant meat. And, of course, they they had eaten elephant meat before, so they were ecstatic. And so we butchered the three elephants and distributed the meat as far as we could. So that, that helped. What, what a wonderful story. Wonderful story. Another wonderful story that you were involved with, it involves... Kids, soap, and washcloths. <laughs> Something so simple. Yes, sir. Yeah. What's that all about? So simple. Walking through the villages, and these were all very poor villages, and walking through the villages, and you'd see the little kids with big old sores on them and dirty, and it just broke your heart. So most of us wrote home to our mamas and said, Mom, would you send us washcloths and soap? So... When they did, well, then we would, whenever we'd go out through the villages, we would take washcloth and soap and sit down and wash the babies. You know, just something so simple, just wash the babies. And then the next time we came through the, to the village, they they knew we were coming because of the, <laughs> they well, they knew we were coming. Uh -huh. And they would be waiting in line for us. Oh, to, my. to get washed and they'd, we'd set them on our knee and you know usually we'd sit on a five gallon bucket or something and just bring the baby up on our knee and wash them and clean them all up and then hand them back to their mamas and it worked great that was that was always a fun thing to do it made your heart feel good one one other story that the uh journalist would call sidebar involves a a uh gentleman uh who served with you uh, Sergeant Johnston Dunlop, and yes, sir. and the song Shenandoah Valley. Shenandoah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Now you're 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 a guitar player, and a mouth organ player. Are you not? Yes, sir. I've I played the guitar since I was a very young boy. I I learned how to play the harmonica in Vietnam. And one of the people you played it for was Sergeant Johnston Dunlop. Yes, sir. What song? Did, yeah, what was the story there? Um, would you like me to read the story, sir? No, I don't want you to read it just from memory. Tell me. Oh, the story of Sergeant Dunlap? Well, Sergeant Dunlap and I... Dunlap and the Shenandoah. Yes, sir. We went through basic training together. Sergeant Dunlap had been in the military four years prior and then had gotten out to go to college and then... When he graduated from college, he came back into the military, and but because he'd been out over 
three years, they made him go back to basic training again. So that's how I knew Johnston. He was in basic training with me. Well, then he went directly from basic, from basic training to Vietnam. Well, I had to go through advanced individual training and then Vietnam. So I was a month and a half behind him. And when I got over there, well, he was in the 9th Infantry Division also. Uh, he was not in my unit but he was in units that we supported, and that's how Johnston and I got together again, always. He would know where we were at because he was in the LERPs, Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol, and it was their job to find out where the artillery needed to be to best support the infantry that were out working, doing their job. And so he would call us in to our FO and tell us, okay, we need to be at this grid coordinates. Well, he always knew where we were. Usually, before it got dark, he would come in through the perimeter, our little perimeter that we'd set up, and that's I started. John asked me about, uh, to play the harmonica for him. Uh, my mother had just sent me a harmonica because <laughs> she thought I was bored. <laughs> so I didn't know how to play it, but I just stuck it in my pocket and was sitting in my foxhole when John came in, and he said, well, Sam, play Shenandoah for me. And I said, well, I don't know how to play it. And what I meant was I didn't know how to play the harmonica. He thought I just didn't know how to play Shenandoah. But when he was E6, I was just a private. <laughs> when the E6 asks you to play your harmonica, your proper response is you start playing it. <laughs> and I'd, I'd been in band in school, and I, one of Shenandoah had been one of the songs that we'd learned how to play. I would play the drums there in French Camp, California, or Manteca, actually, where I we went to high school. And... So Shen, I knew basic how Shenandoah went, <laughs> and after a, a few weeks of Johnston, not not daily because he couldn't be with us every day, but several many times a week, and John would come in and he would encourage me, and then finally uh, he asked or I asked him, I said, well John, why is Shenandoah your favorite song? And he said, well, when I was going to college, there were. A, it's a very liberal college that John went to outside of Washington, D.C., and he said most of the kids there didn't have the depth of patriotism that I had, and rather than having physical confrontations with them when they're burning flags and downgrading America, he said I would get in my car, drive 70 miles straight west to the Shenandoah River Valley, and I would set up on a hill that overlooked the valley and said that it's so beautiful, and you could look down and see the Shenandoah River right below you. And he said it was just just being there. The, the beauty and the serenity of it all just healed my heart and made my soul strong again. And I could get in my car and drive back to school and face the people that didn't believe in America as much as John did. And so he said, when you play it, now this is back in Vietnam, he said, when you play it for me, it just, in my soul, I'm sitting on that hill again, and it just helps renew my spirit. That's so thank you, Sam. Well, I've played that song constantly. Uh, all of my brothers that I served with could hear it naturally, and they would start requesting it, and they still do today. I, I just re attended our, our reunion down in Florida, and that was one of the first things that they asked was, Sam, wow. would you play Shenandoah for us again? So I played Shenandoah. It's just a very uplifting and soothing and calming song for us all. You know, there are some important dates in this book called You Don't Lose Until You Quit Trying. And perhaps the most important date is November 18th, 1967. And we'll be talking about that date when we return. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at JimFosterCoc and email JimFosterCoc at gmail.com. You don't live until you quit trying. Lessons on adversity and victory from a Vietnam veteran and Medal Honor recipient. His name is Sammy Lee Davis, and his co-author is Carolyn Lambert. And, uh, you know, I'm wondering about that. You uh, worked with her on, on the book. How did that work out, that collaboration? Was it smooth or stormy? Oh, very smooth, very smooth. She 
actually came and, and lived with us for a period of time, and I made lots of tapes. She asked questions after question after question. She was very good at ask, asking questions, and evidently I was pretty good at answering because when we sat down to write the book, it it smooth it flowed very smoothly. Yeah, no, it, it does. Uh, you know, I I I see a lot of books, and the the uh, so called collaborations uh, sometimes are not very smooth. But this is this is this is very very smooth. Yes, sir. Well, we fell in love with her. She's part of the family now. You know, before we get to November 18th, uh, one of the most surprising things in your book is that you, then a private first class, developed a relationship with a fellow with a much higher rank, General Westmoreland. How the heck did you pull that off? (laughs) Well, about two weeks before what happened at Firebase Cudgel. Uh, General Westmoreland was famous for if he seen you down there doing your job and, and as long as you weren't in contact with the enemy, he would land the helicopter and get out and come talk to his troops. Wow. And this was one of those occasions. And we just had, I think we had four guns, four howitzers out on the op. And so when the helicopter landed, our captain came running by and he said, it's General William Childs Westmoreland. Just do whatever he wants. <laughs> he came to our gun. Well, we quit firing. We were just firing H&Is, which is uh, harassment interdiction rounds. And when he came to our gun, we quit firing, and the other three guns took up the pace. And we were standing there in all of our glory, which <laughs> the artillery as a rule fought the, the war in trousers and in boots because it was hot. And now we had our flak jacket and our M16 sitting there by the gun, but we didn't have it on. So there we were. We were didn't have a shirt on. All we had were pants and, and boots. So Westy came up and started talking. There were just four of us. And he started talking to the other guys, and I could hear the questions that he was asking them. And it was all the same questions that generals are supposed to ask. Are you getting your letters from home? You're getting your. We're supposed to get one hot meal a day. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> all yeah. those kind of questions. And of course, we knew the proper answer was, "Sir, everything is wonderful." <laughs> That's what we're supposed. To do. <laughs> so when he stepped up in front of me, and I looked him right in the eye, and he looked me in the eye, and then he looked down, and I was all muddy because we were set up in a real muddy area. This is in southern most portion of Vietnam, and he looked down at my boots. Well, as he was looking down at my boots, I remembered that I had holes <laughs> over. My, where my little toes were. They just had stuck out of the boot because I had not DX'd my books to get boots to get new ones because my feet were doing better than some of the other kids. And the new boots held water, and my boots had big holes there. So it would let the water drain out. When you would get up to some place that was dry, my feet would dry out and made them a little bit better conditioned than a lot of the kids. So that's why I hadn't... DX my boots I uh, had big holes in them but he looked down at my feet and I seen his eyes kind of get big and I wiggled my toes at him and he said well son no, he didn't say son he said private is that the only pair of boots you have and I said yes sir it is and he turned to say something to my captain and noticed that my captain had put on a brand new pair of boots to go out on the upper with and he turned to me and he said private what size are those boots and I said 10w sir and he said, Captain, what size are those boots? And he said, 10W, sir. He said, well, take those boots off and give them to that boy. <laughs> <laughs> Down the mud, and I put my new boots on, and I was just happier than heck. So that's how I met General Westmoreland. <laughs> and two weeks later is when I ended up in the hospital from Firebase Cudgel, and that's what I used. I said, you know, General Westmoreland and I are good friends. We, he just gave me a new pair of boots a couple weeks ago. <laughs> You better treat me good. Well, he indeed did remember me when the colonel in charge of the hospital called General Westmoreland. Westmoreland had, this is from General Westmoreland, told me this a month or so later. He said, I had just laid down the paperwork that would ultimately end up being your Medal of Honor citation. And he said, son, I would have given you the world and the only thing you wanted was to go back to Vietnam and be with the brothers. And so that's how I got to go back to Vietnam and be with my unit. It was not standard practice that when a unit 
got severely wounded, they would bring in new guys, all new guys. And But they, General Westmoreland allowed me to go back to my unit and be with my guys. So that worked very well for me. It sure did. You know, your your unit really did take it, and 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 and, and you did too. Uh, you're you're under a massive enemy uh, offensive, and you decided to face it, and you were really prepared to die. And soon, as the battle went on, you would have, among other things, a perforated kidney, crushed ribs, a broken vertebra ripped flesh from beehive darts, a bullet in your thigh, and burns all over your body. This, it seems to me, is a time to go hide. And you didn't. What did you do? I did my job. I was protecting my brothers because I was the, the enemy were coming predominantly right across the river, right over my position, and I was doing my best to there were, there were 1,200 of the enemy and only 42 of us artillerymen. Now, there were segments of some infantry units that were across the river and surrounding us, but they had suffered tremendously also. And I was just simply doing my job when I had fired all the M60 ammunition, and then I'd fired all my M16 ammunition, and the only thing I had left was the cannon. Well, I only fired one round out of the 105 howitzer, and that's when the enemy across the canal from me, that's when he fired the rocket and hit the gun, and that's what blew me into the foxhole. And I was half in and half out of the foxhole laying up over the sandbags. And when the enemy started turning my howitzer around, the guys behind me seen that, and they took for granted that we were all dead because they could see him going around shooting us and so they fired the beehive. That's how I got hit with the beehive round. That's our round. And But that when the beehive hit me, it woke me up and saved my life because if I hadn't, they would have surely came by and shot me in, in just a minute or two. So my guys saved my life. And that's when I seen Gwendell across the river waving his hat at me. And I had fired several howitzer rounds before that. Uh, the, the last round that I remember firing was a propaganda round. It had two Hoy notes in it, and I was firing at direct fire. And that's when Gwendell stood up and waved his hat at me and said, Don't shoot, I'm a GI. And I thought, Wow, this is, you know, my brother. I've got to go get him. So I gathered an air mattress because I didn't think my body would, I knew how to swim. It's just I didn't think my body was going to function well enough just to swim across the canal. So I thought I better have an air mattress. And that's what I did. I got the air mattress and went across the canal and then crawled up through the jungle to where I'd last seen Gwendell standing, and there was a foxhole there. And instead of just one man being there, there were three men. And it was Gwendell Holloway, Jim Deister, and Billy Ray Crawford. And all of them were wounded. Uh, Jim Deister had been shot through the head and through the chest. Uh, Billy Ray Crawford from Alvin, Texas, had been uh, his left leg had gotten blown off below the knee. And Gwendell had a big hole in his head and had gotten shot through the chest, but he was still breathing okay. It was down below his lung. Mm. So we all three helped each other back. I pulled Jim Deister, the man we thought was dead, right up across my shoulders. And then Billy Ray and, and Gwendell, I scooped up with my arms, and we all three helped each other. So we all took care of each other, and we made it back across the river. And You do for your brothers what you know they'd do for you. And the reason you do that is because your mother told you a long time ago, don't ever leave your little brother behind. You don't ever leave your brother behind. That's a fact. Don't ever. Oh, my goodness. You know, the story of Sammy Lee Davis did not end with the end of that story in Vietnam. It's gone on proudly. Stay tuned and we'll tell you more about it. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at Jim Foster COC and email Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. Our author today is Sergeant Sammy Lee Davis, and he's written a book with Carolyn Lambert called You Don't Lose Till You Quit Trying. 
Lessons on Adversity and Victory from a Vietnam Veteran and Medal of Honor Recipient. And Colonel Jack Jacobs, retired, says this about Sammy's book, Sammy Davis's Exploits. May sound like a movie script, but Sammy, Sammy, is the real deal. And you know, talking to you, even for this short time, and I'm really glad you've joined us, makes me feel the same way. I think you're the real deal. Well, thank you, brother. And there's a part of the book that I'd like you to share with our listeners. And uh, I, I don't think it needs an introduction, do you? You can just start. What do you think? Yes, sir. I think we can just start. All right. Let's start. Thank you. I reached for the harmonica tucked in my breast pocket. I had brought my old harp, the one that my mom had sent me in Vietnam. Seeing Johnston Dunlap's name etched on the black wall right in front of me, I went back to all those times I'd played for Johnston setting in the foxholes all those years before. With my eyes closed and a lump in my throat, I played Shenandoah for my Vietnam brother again so he could rest one more time. There were a few people around, but I figured they wouldn't mind. By the time I was done, I'd opened my eyes. Dozens of men stood around me in the dark, silent. At first, I thought they were the ghost of the dead and missing soldiers whose names were etched on the wall. And for a few seconds, I was concerned that I'd completely gone off my rocker. But all these men were alive and breathing, and they were Vietnam veterans who had come to visit their fallen brothers for the first time. They'd been a bit farther out and came down when they'd heard the harp. Like me, they had come to touch the names of their brothers at night so they could cry in the privacy of darkness. They'd come in the tens of thousands from all over the United States. They'd come in by car, by bus, or by plane. Some even came on foot, working, walking hundreds of miles to be there. Some had spent their last dollars to attend the event. Like me, they had traveled to Washington, D.C. to inaugurate the Vietnam Veterans Memorial a few days later. It had been a long time coming. Like most of my Vietnam brothers, I too had often been shunned and screamed at and chest poked for 15 years. I felt the way that we'd been treated had actually grown worse over the 70s. Every time I attended some event, there would be the protesters. I learned to stay calm and to give them a big old military salute. Only a year or two before my trip to Washington, D.C., I'd sat with Jan Scruggs on a park bench in Los Angeles, and things were looking bleak. Jan, a wounded and decorated Vietnam veteran, had come up with the idea of building a memorial to honor all those who had served in Vietnam and to heal the wounds that the war had inflicted upon America. He had put on in his own money and was working real hard to make it happen. His efforts were being met with a lot of resistance, and there were many complications, and raising the money to build the memorial was tough. That day in Los Angeles, Jan was disheartened. He had just attended one of his big fundraisers, which, was not, which had not produced the results that he had been hoping for. We sat on that bench in a little park just outside the hotel, sharing a bottle of wine. But Jan didn't quit trying. He didn't quit when some people objected to the memorial design or its architect, a 21-year-old Chinese-American lady from Ohio, and tried real hard to sink the project. When the Secretary of Interior blocked it, Jan, Jan just kept going. He eventually, eventually gathered over $8 million in private contributions and got it built. Over the days before the dedication, Washington, D.C. was swarming with Vietnam veterans. There were receptions and emotional reunions. The wall was open to the public all week ahead of the big day. For three days, a round-the-clock vigil was held at the Washington National Cathedral, where volunteers working in shifts of 30 minutes read the names carved on the memorial. When someone asked me if I wanted to read, I gladly accepted. In the chapel, adorned with only two large candles and red roses, I stood in front of rows of people, mothers, fathers, brothers and sisters, comrades, who we'd fought side by side. They'd all come to hear a name. With a list of a sheet of paper in my hand, I started reading slowly. Each name a young man fallen for his country. Each name a life ended much too soon. 
Each name now spoken out loud for all to hear and to honor. Each name saying, I once lived. I was here. I gave my life for you. These names would now be known and remembered, not just by the loved ones, but by the whole nation. A nation that in its struggle to become, to come to grips with a war that had scorched its soil, had tried to forget them and all they had sacrificed. As I kept reading, a tidal wave of grief washed over me. I broke down and fell to one knee. I managed to keep reading, but I couldn't get up. Someone helped me back to my feet, and it took all I had to keep until I'd spoken the very last name. I think that's a great way to end this. It almost is at the very end of the book. And it, it tells us so much about you, and it tells us so much about ourselves and what our attitude has been, and I guess in some cases continues to be about the Vietnam War. You're a teacher. You're an inspiration. And it's been great to have you on Conversations on the Coast. The title Thank of the you, book, You Don't Lose Till You Quit Trying. The author is Sammy Lee Davis with Carolyn Lambert. And this is Jim Foster, Conversations on the Coast. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at Jim Foster COC and email Jim Foster COC at gmail.com.